Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm here with Becca Puglisi. Hi Becca. Hi, so excited to be here, thank you. Oh no, it's great to have you on the show. Just a little introduction. Becca is an international speaker, writing coach and best-selling author of the Thesaurus series for writers, which can be hard to say, <laughs> including the latest edition, which I have right here, if you're on the video, the Emotional Wound Thesaurus. I actually have a whole pile of them on my desk. <laughs> Becca also writes YA and historical fiction and can also be found at writershelpingwriters.com net along with her co-author Angela Ackerman. So Becca we're going to talk about the thesaurus but start by telling us a bit more about you. How did you get into writing and publishing? <laughs> sure uh, it's kind of weird. I, I, My husband and I this was my gosh 10-15 years ago my husband and I were um, not making a lot of money. There was something I really wanted to contribute to um, and I, I didn't have any money so I was praying and I just you know prayed God how can I make some money and God said write a book which it seemed like ridiculous advice because you know how long it takes to make money sometimes when you're <laughs> trying to do it as an author. But I had, I wasn't one of those people who, who wrote all the time as a kid. You know, I wasn't constantly making up stories and everything. So I thought, Oh, okay. Well I taught school. And so I read a lot. And so I, that's how I got started. And when I, once I started it, I loved it. And I just fell in love with it and, and realized I had kind of a knack for it. And so I just kind of started on the journey that way. Um, and then Angela and I, of course, met at a critique site at Critique Circle Online. Um, and that's where we met and, and we started as critique partners and then we moved on to blogging partners and then ended up, you know, eventually becoming um, co-authors and publishing our books. So that's kind of how that all happened. And did you have a, a career before writing or what did you used I, to do? I taught school. I was an elementary school teacher. So I started out writing picture books because I read those all day long. I taught first grade. Um, but they're really, really hard. <laughs> but, yeah, they are they're definitely. They're actually <laughs> harder in some ways than trying to write a full novel because it's so concise and you have to use such an economy of words. So oh, definitely. that's kind of I've made that transition along the way. So that sounds really interesting. And I'm I'm actually interested in your faith aspect there. Um, so how has your faith become part of your writing journey? Because you've written a lot of books now, fiction and nonfiction. And I'm always interested in um, people of faith who write, uh, oh, you write YA, not fantasy, right? But how does your well, faith come into that? Well, most of my books are fantasy mm. books. And you know, it's funny, it's, it's weird because my, my faith is very, it's integral to everything in my life. But when I'm writing, I don't write a lot of faith-based stuff. There's a lot of, there's a lot of redemption and those kind of themes in the stories that I write, but, um, uh, it doesn't figure largely into my fiction writing when it comes to the nonfiction, you know, it does trickle in ironically a little bit more. I think that, you know, Angela and I are, are, in different places on our journeys. And, and I end up, I think, putting less faith stuff into our combined works. And she ends up putting more than she would typically use because of my influence. We kind of um, influence each other that way. But it's it's interesting because I've looked into to writing Christian fiction and I just, I think there are a lot of um, struggles there. There's a lot of things that you have to master that you don't have to master in other genres. Hmm. And, you know, that is something that I'm open to doing one day. It's just, I, I have never taken that step. Mm. I it, I find that so interesting. We might circle back to that on character okay. because I think it's so important. But let's um let's just start with the kind of the question of why you and Angela decided to write thesaurus type books. Now the typical thesaurus, you know, most of us would use thesaurus.com and, you know, type in blue right. or whatever and try and come up with something. But these books have other chapters and helpful things on. So what need did you see in the writing community that you decided to write these books? And, and also tell people a bit more about them, like what they're Sure. Mm. Um, it totally came out of a personal need. We were critique partners at the time and I we were very early in our writing journey and I was noticing my characters were always smiling and shuffling their feet um, and shrugging. <laughs> and I could not figure out 
You know, there's so many ways that you can show those emotions, but I couldn't figure out any other way. So I started just a list of emotions and just writing down different options of different things that were happening in the body. I started looking at, at TV and movies and seeing what the actors were doing to portray that emotion, just so I would have more options. And then I thought, you know, if this is something I'm struggling with, maybe other writers are struggling too. So I took it to the critique group and every single person was like, yes, this is a total problem I have except, you know, mine is frowning or clenching the fist. So, you know, everybody has their different thing that they get hung up on. So we started adding to the list and adding more emotions. And, and we did that for a while. Interest kind of flagged and it, it turned out just being me and Angela who were working on them. And then when we started um, the blog, she called me, oh gosh, uh, that was like four years later. I was getting ready to take a break because I was pregnant with my first child. And, and she said, um, I'm going to start a blog and, and I think that, you know, it would be easier if we did it together. So let's do it together. And I was like, oh my gosh, the timing is terrible. Um, but she's, you know, she was absolutely right that you, you, you want to build your presence before you, you know, start actively, um, promoting your book. So even though the timing was crazy, we, we started that and she said, you know, I really want to build a, a blog where where we're offering information that is really meaningful and practical and that people are going to come back for because it's so useful to them. She said, what about, you know, the emotion lists that we were building? What if we, we take that and we do one each week and we just keep building and adding more emotions? And that was where the emotion thesaurus came from. And it's just um, to talk about what exactly it is. It does sound like a thesaurus, which is not totally, uh, I guess, your typical idea of a thesaurus, but it's it's got a two-page spread for each emotion, and then it tells you what the what the physical signals are for that emotion, what the thoughts are that a, a person might be having when they're feeling that, what the visceral reactions are, what's going on inside of their body, kind of those immediate um, unavoidable things that happen when you start feeling that emotion, um, cues of acute or long-term feeling of that emotion. You know, if you have been experiencing it for a long time, you're going to have more aggressive kind of responses to it. And it just gives you all these ideas so that if you're writing a, an emotion and you can't figure out a new way to do it, um, you can look at it and say, oh, oh, that's, you know, that's something I hadn't thought of and I can adapt it to exactly match my character and what he would do or, or the kind of ticks that he has. Um, it just gives, it's, it's really a brainstorming option for mm -hmm. writers that they can kind of look through and, and get ideas and, and make them really fit their character. So that was where the emotion thesaurus came up. And like you said, it came exactly out of a need that personally we both had. And that's been the one that's been kind of viral in that everybody, it seems, does have that problem. At some point in their writing, they realize that that's an issue for them and, and there wasn't anything to address it. So mm. it fit the need perfectly. Yeah, and I'm... Well, let's just give a, a specific example because, you know, it can be kind of easy to talk about when you know what you're talking about. But let's right. say um, anger. So I'm writing and I'm like, I'm angry with you, Becca, said Joanna. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how would we use the thesaurus to write that in a better way? Yeah, well, the problem, the, the first problem, and this is a problem that I see very often with first page critiques, um, is that we want, you know, I think we lack our, comp, our, our, uh, our ability to convey that emotion. We know it's really important because readers empathize with characters when they know what that character is feeling and they get kind of a hint of that feeling themselves. It's kind of like an emotional echo that they feel mm. that makes a connection with them. So being able to convey the character's emotion is super important. And I think we get nervous that we're not able to do that. And so we end up telling it. Whenever you see the emotion named, that it's, it's been told instead of shown. Um, show, don't tell. I know it gets a lot of, um, well, there's a lot of discussion about it. And, and there are places where telling, obviously, is preferred. But when, when you're talking about emotion, most of the time, it's better to show it. Because you are showing that emotion in a way that creates this experience for the reader to go along with. It's like they're walking with the character, they're going through these things with them instead of just sitting back and passively listening to their emotion being told. So when it comes to showing emotion instead of telling, we, I like to, to tell people to, first of all, look at the body language because like, what is it, 93% of 
of communication is nonverbal. We're just wired to read other people's signals, what's happening on their face, what's happening with the rest of their body, with their posture, with their bearing. And that tells us kind of where they stand. So if we can master that body language, readers are going to pick up on it because they're just made to do that. So I always like to tell people to think about the whole body. We always kind of get hung up on whatever our crutch is. But if you think about, well, what's what are the hands doing? What are the feet doing? What's the overall posture? How would it change when there's been a change of emotion? Um, and, and just trying to look at the whole body can give uh, readers or writers a more options for how to show that emotion in a way that that readers are going to kind of clue into. It's going to pull them more into the character's experience. Mm. So again, just trying to be more specific, what what would we write about anger that is not? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm angry with you. (laughs) Yes. Um, So you might think, okay, instead of saying I'm angry, show the change, you know, everything is great. People are talking and you're, you know, having a good time. And then the person says something and all of a sudden your character experiences a change of some kind. Maybe they step back. Maybe they, um, their, their brows come together. Maybe they cross their arms. Um, they might turn away from that person and they're still like kind of in the conversation, but they're not as involved as they were before. Um, they might become confrontational and start kind of pressing the other person's buttons. These are all kind of steps toward that anger because of course, another thing with emotion that we have to keep in mind is that it's progressive. Um, You know, that we wanna make sure that we're progressing naturally in that emotional range. But those are some sources, some ways that you can show the anger is, um, you know, the, the eyebrows lowering, fists, hands clenching into fists or, um, things like that are ways that you can show that a person's emotion has changed and those specifically would indicate anger. Mm. Yeah, I always like the um the the example of kind of, you know, slam I'm fine and slamming down a mug or something, right. which it happens a lot in relationships. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um so but I I'm, I'm actually interested on the charac- on the emotion and the behavior side of the thesaurus. I was talking interviewing someone else about cultural differences. Now, mm. behavior by different cultures can show different things. So for example, um, burping after food in Britain, is just not something you do. It's not polite and it would be considered rude. Whereas burping after food in some cultures is considered a sign of appreciation. And if you don't do it, you know, you're not, you're not showing respect. Sure. So have you, have you thought about those um, in, in the emotion thesaurus or the other ones, any kind of cultural differences or is that something that, you know, might be a good idea for the future? <laughs> Well, I mean, that's always something to consider because we're always looking for ways to expand um, the emotion of the source because it's, it's been very popular. We talked about that at one point in the process, and it was just, it was so daunting because there's so many things that change from culture to culture. And we were afraid that if we included those, it was going to get contradictory or confusing for readers. So we kind of shelved that. Um, what has happened that is good is that we have been picked up in a number of different foreign countries and languages. And they, the publisher there, they do have the freedom to kind of add or tweak um, to account for their particular culture. So in that way, it's good that, you know, this very westernized, really, um, kind of collection of of emotional cues is when it goes to another country and they put it into that language, they they tweak it a little bit so that it matches Mm. for them. Yeah, I think I think that's that's so interesting. So let's talk about some of the other um, thesauruses. So there's the positive and the negative trait thesaurus, which yes. I think, and it's funny because of course, when you're a new writer, you don't necessarily know those phrases. Like positive traits are things that you right. progress into as you learn about writing. I think, um, but how? What are some examples? How can a writer flesh out a character with positive or negative attributes? And is that different for a hero? and a villain? Um, well, I think, first of all, that we have to have a combination. You know, I, I, I know that in the very early stages of writing, we tend to, you know, we only have the characters that have the, the really good attributes, the ones that we wish we had or the ones that we know are really likable 
or you've got this character with this monster flaw that's like really obvious. Mm -hmm. And the truth is that we are a mixture of both, you know, so we need to make sure that our characters have both positive attributes and negative traits. Um, because the positive traits are really the ones that help them succeed. They're the ones that are going to help them relationally. They're going to help them um, overcome problems and, and achieve that overall story goal. And the flaws, of course, are going to trip them up. They're going to create these um, scenarios in the story that set them back or that allow them to grow and overcome. So they're both really, really important for us to build into our characters. And I say build in because that's the other thing that I think is crucial is that the, the traits that our characters have, they come from somewhere. If you look at real people, uh, most of our like defining traits, whether good or bad, they come from something in our past, um, it, whether it's an influential person that we really admired and we took on those traits that they embraced or um, the caregivers in our life, you know, just instilled certain values in us. Um, likewise, you know, negative traits come from bad experiences that we've had. Uh, many times they're things that we have adopted as a way of protecting ourselves, ironically. We think they're protecting us, but they are actually causing us harm. Um, so they come from somewhere, they come from wounds, they come from positive and negative experiences that we've had and from the people in our lives. And when we can figure out where they come from so that we can make sure that we're creating this character that makes sense, they just ring true with readers. Um, we don't have to worry about the kind of flat one dimensional characters that, um, that many of us aren't drawn to. So making sure that, that those traits come out of something and make sense for the character in their, the course of their life, I think is really important. Yeah, I, I agree. And I mean, some traits are positive and negative. Uh, I was just, you know, thinking about ambition because I'm, exactly. ve I'm very ambitious, for example. I absolutely am. Um, and I realise that that is both a positive trait because I achieve things, um, yep. but it can also be negative for me because I overwork in order to achieve <laughs> big goals. And I hope I don't, but, you know, some in like, you know, Wall Street and things, ambition can mean stepping on other people. On, sure. on the way so you know because you have two different books obviously positive and negative so do you do you sort of cover the same traits in both a positive and negative way because that does happen right right we spent so much time <laughs> looking at our list and trying to figure out where things fit you know do they go in the positive do they go in the negative some of them are kind of like neutral you know like where do we put them because you're right you know comp competitive is another one you know competitiveness can really help you in a lot of ways, but it can be taken to an extreme um, where it's not healthy. And for certain people, it's just not healthy. So we really tried to keep them as separate as we could. You know, we, we looked at the ones that, that we, we thought were, were more helpful and advantageous, and we put them in the positive one, and we focused on the, um, the good and, and, and what they provide. And then we took the ones that were more harmful and put them in the negative one and, and kind of focused on that that way. Um, there is something, one of the things that I love about the character trait the sources is that for each trait, we look at, um, we look, I'm sorry, I'm trying to remember because I don't have my book right here with me. Um, we look at the positive and the negative side of that trait. So, mm -hmm. you know, you could have something that's really good, like obedience. I mean, that's a good trait to have. And we talk about why this can help your character and how it's good. But then we also talk about how it can become unhealthy, you know, when obedience becomes blind obedience or um, uh, when it's taken to an extreme and it becomes subservience, mm. you know, that there are good things, there are bad things. You can become really gullible and, and be um, taken advantage of if you have that in a way that it's not, again, tempered with other traits. So that was one of the coolest things in writing those books was kind of that aha moment of, oh my gosh, there's, you know, it may be primarily good or primarily bad, but there are both good and bad things that can come out of it. And that's something really real from real life that we can kind of instill into our characters and increase that sense of, of relatability for readers. It's so funny you mentioned obedience and in the context of faith, because I actually did my thesis at college on obedience to God um, in religion and how that can be a positive thing and a negative thing when, hmm. um, you know, when people do violent things in the name of God. Right? And actually, sure. um, and I wrote a novel, Crypt of Bone, about that idea. So it's so interesting. We can take these sort of big 
themes I mean obedience is like a, is a theme I mean it's much bigger right. isn't it really and, and kind yeah. of construct whole stories around that so that's that's fascinating so you mentioned um about flat characters and how having these different traits can help us bring them alive but you, you know what are the other things that writers get wrong in constructing ca- or writing characters that just don't resonate with an audience mm. you know like I watched yeah. a movie the other day and we my husband and I were like I just don't care I really <laughs> don't care what's happening to this person right. you know versus where we're just really involved how do we do that well, I think that's the key is that we have to make the reader care. I mean, there's so many books on the market and now, especially with self-publishing taking off it, I mean, there's just so many options for readers. We, and I think that the, the key is that they, they have to care about the character, about the story, about what's happening. And I had this, um, epiphany a couple of years ago, I was, I realized that I was starting a lot of books that I didn't finish reading. And so I wanted to kind of explore that and make sure figure out why I was not finishing these books so that I wouldn't make those mistakes in my own writing. And almost in every case, it was a problem with the character. Um, a lot of times I think there is a, an emotional void where you, you just don't see exactly what the character's feeling or you're not, you're confused about what they're feeling. And so, and a lot, this isn't like a conscious thing. I think when we're reading, we automatically kind of tune into those emotions. And when the, the, the author hasn't expressed clearly enough or expressed enough emotion, we don't know what they're feeling. So we don't know how we're supposed to feel. I think that is, is a, a, a common problem. Um, and I think also the, the telling of the emotion kind of pulls us out mm. and, and, makes us not really connect. Um, the relatability issue I think is also really important is a lot of times, you know, you have a character, there's a scenario that the story is interesting and the scenario is interesting. Um, and the character, it, it, it's just not someone that we can relate to. I think a lot of times in that case, um, the stakes are not high enough or they're not obvious enough because we don't know what's threatening them. We don't know, uh, what we're supposed to be rooting for, you know, like, like if, if the character is not, so aware of what's at stake, then, you know, why should we care about what's at stake? So I think stakes can be um, really key. And again, just the character that doesn't quite make sense. You know, you have the character that isn't, I think there's not enough thought put into the backstory so Mm -hmm. that they, they seem kind of mechanical or like a bunch of things have just been thrown together for them. But there's also the, the character who, um, their, their goals sometimes are not relatable enough, you know, like, which is a tough one because we kind of see the same goals and stories repeated throughout time. You know, mm-hmm. there are like, um, a finite, I think, uh, set of, of story goals that, that tend to work. Um, and if we just don't, if we can't connect to what the character is after, if we don't understand really the why behind that, I think that that kind of, um, creates a flat character because every character has a goal. And I think that as readers, we don't really connect so much with the outer goal as with the inner reason for them pursuing that goal. You know, the, why are they after that? Why is it so important for them to get this job or to, um, find love with this person? And that why, you know, really comes from a need that's missing in their life. It's one of those, I believe one of the the five basic human needs going back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And so when we haven't really fleshed that out as authors, a lot of times we end up with a character who has this goal and it makes sense for the story, but there's really not that underlying, um, that underlying piece that, that readers connect with, which is that need, that, that desire that's driving them towards that. That I think is what really draws readers in when it comes to goals. So that's another place where I think readers, uh, characters can sometimes come across as, as just someone that we can't really get on board with. Yeah, and, and I, I I agree. And But relatable can be a bigger, like you say, it's around the goal. So we just watched this documentary on um, weightlifting. So so the, it, it based, and I didn't want to watch it. My husband right. was like, well, you know, I want to watch this and I you made me watch the other thing. So, <laughs> so, we, so we watched it and I was like, all right. And within minutes, I was hooked because they opened with the final weight that these men had to lift. Oh, and wow. they opened with this is, and so you knew the stakes was this, and you knew the open question, which 
which was who was going to win. And then each of the characters were like these six foot eight men with, you know, I could not relate on, you know, really hard. But I related to their need to define themselves by winning something that they cared about and that they basically staked their whole life on and what they gave up. And so it's interesting because, the like you said, the relatable is more the deep thing behind the actual thing. It's not like I need to relate to lifting heavy weights. It's that I can relate to wanting to achieve the pinnacle of my career before I get too old. (laughs) Right. And I think that's why Katniss Everdeen, why the Hunger Games, Mm. like kind of crossed all boundaries and everyone loved that story. It was because no one could relate to her circumstances. You know, most of us are not (laughs) fighting for our life on a daily basis. But her need was so great. I mean, we're talking about survival. We're talking about protecting the people that you love and keeping them safe and, and putting yourself in danger if need be. So that need, I think, is is crucial. I think it's really important. Mm-hmm. Interestingly enough, comes out of the wound, you know, which doesn't seem like, you know, you would follow those breadcrumbs and be able to connect those pieces. But that's another way that you can make your character really realistic is by building that backstory and kind of figuring out everything that happens because of what has happened to the character. And you end up in the current story with a character who has this need and it's based on something real and they're going to have to come up with a story goal that's going to fulfill that need. It's just, it's fascinating because as we were writing that book in particular, we just had so many revelations of, oh my gosh, this, it all fits together. And you can really make these characters that feel really real because this is kind of what happens in real life with people. Yeah, so. well, that's what's so interesting. I mean, when you actually get deeper into character, we're essentially talking about psychology. And Absolutely. if you're writing an alien civilization, you still have to use aspects of human psychology so that people relate to the aliens or whatever. Right. Um, so let's go into the emotional wound um, thesaurus because the phrase emotional wound is actually, I mean, it's pretty deep and meaningful and you have to kind of go, okay, I'm ready to have a look at this book you know it's, <laughs> do I, I mean, want to read this right. I, so let I mean let's let's just kind of you know put put it in more obvious w- uh, reason why an author needs to look at emotional wounds and needs to consider almost go deeper into themselves like what what are some of the examples of emotional wounds that we can bring sure well an emotional wound is basically it's a, an intensely negative experience that causes pain on a on a deep psychological level for the person, for the character. These are things that we have experienced in our real life. And they they do mirror, again, things that happen in real life and the the things that come out of it, you can apply to your characters and end up with these really real um, characters. So if you think about, well, let me explain just a little bit first about how it all all works. You know, Mm -hmm. you have this terrible thing that happens in the past and what we always tend to do when something bad happens is that we we want to examine it and figure out why it happened. Like there has to be a reason. We have to have a be able to put it into context. And oh my gosh, is there something we could have done that that I could have prevented what happened from happening so it doesn't happen again? This is kind of the, the human nature is to to look at that from every angle and try to figure it out. And what we very often, unfortunately, end up coming away with is that we were somehow to blame is that there was something we did or we didn't do that, you know, had we reacted differently, the outcome would have been different. And very often this turns into a a false belief or a lie that we now start to believe uh, either about ourselves or about the world at large. Um, And that lie, it, it, it takes root and it starts to dictate our behavior. Because if we really believe something about ourselves, it's going to determine what our, some of our traits are what our values are, what choices we make, what habits we take on, um, what behaviors we we do, the choices that we make. It it really permeates everything. And very often, as I mentioned before, we'll we'll take on these habits and and, and character traits that we think are going to protect us. You know, they're going to keep us safe, but they actually cause even more problems. And very often they they end up creating a void in, in the area of one of those needs. And that's kind of the whole process of like, what the wound is and what it does to the character. And it gets you to the current story. And and now this is my character as a person. This is their baggage. This is who they are. And then you can move forward with this really well-rounded character. To take like a, a concrete example, one of the, the wounds we have is cracking under pressure. Like somebody who it's very important that they do really well and they just totally fail. Maybe in a, in a business standpoint. 
Um, so somebody with this kind of wound in their past is going to maybe possibly come out of it with this belief that they're not capable, like that they're okay with the little stuff, but oh, please don't put me in charge of anything important because I'm totally going to blow it. So the habits that come out of that are that they then start settling for mediocrity. You know, they're not going to pursue big goals. They're not mm -hmm. going to try new things. They're going to become risk averse. They're going to avoid responsibility. Um, they might be part of a team, but they're never going to take charge. These are all some of them behaviors, some of them traits that come right out of that wound. And then as a result, they start to either, it's going to impact a need. It, it might be esteem because they realize that they're, they're not living up to their full potential, that they are not succeeding in business because of the way that they're holding themselves back. So now they're gonna choose a story goal that is going to try to fill that need, but all of their habits and their, their emotional shielding that they've put up is gonna really kind of keep them from, it, from getting that goal. So that's one example. Um, there's, oh gosh, there's like 110 <laughs> different wounds. It there was so there are so many. I mean, I, I, it really is an interesting, um, you know, I, I, I do have it here um, and it's got, I mean, it's got some pretty traumatic um, things in, you know, childhood being raised by neglected parents or an addict. And I mean, uh, all kinds of dysfunctions, injustice, you know, being attacked. It really... It, it makes quite harrowing reading. And I mean, I, I don't really believe in this kind of trigger warning thing, but I do. you do have a bit at the beginning, don't you, which says you need to be careful when reading this because it's, it is a self-examination book. And I found it very interesting because I write, I mean, I my Arcane series has, you know, she's not an assassin, but she does kill a lot of people in a lot of books, <laughs> Morgan Sierra. And in the first book, within a couple of chapters, she shot someone and... and although I do hint and her husband had been killed in the military and I do echo back to that, but it's so interesting reading those chapters about what happens after the, you know, the violent death of a loved one. And, you know, thinking about these in a much more deep and meaningful level, I think is very powerful. So um, I guess, yeah, you, you have to be careful reading this book and kind of be prepared for it, but it is very powerful. So did you tackle anything yourself when you were writing it that kind of surprised you? I think Angela and I both had like therapy moment epiphanies when we were reading where we're like, oh my gosh, this is why I'm the way I am because this is, this is what happened to me. I mean, it really was very um, self revelatory. Mm -hmm. We did not think of it that that was going to be an issue, you know, when we wrote it. Um, and I, like you, I think that sometimes the, the trigger warning thing can get a little, you know, they can you over the top overboard with that. <laughs> um, but as we were writing the book, we, it took us longer than we anticipated because it was so draining. I mean, we mm. would take, you know, we, we take the whole list of, of the entries that we want to write and we split them in half and she writes one half and I write one half. And then we, we switch and edit and, and do all of that. But it, we could only do like one or two entries a day. I mean, we were really planning on being done sooner, but we kept writing each other saying, I, I feel, t I just, I just feel so heavy, you know I mean? Because you, mm -hmm. you're researching it and you realize, oh my gosh, there are people walking around with this. Like every day it's, it's happening right now to somebody in the world. I mean, there was kind of this weight that came with this book that we were not anticipating of, <sighs> Yes, we're looking at this from a characterization perspective and a, a, a writing perspective, and this can be super, super helpful for writers, but we have to be very um, respectful of mm. the real people who are writers who are going to be reading this book, and they're reading through it, and all of a sudden they come across you know, the entry that is their own wound from their own past, and maybe they've dealt with it, maybe they haven't. So that's why we included, that was an afterthought, um, the care, taking care when you're writing it section, mm -hmm. uh, because we just realized that we were kind of struggling with it ourselves and just, we knew that it was going to be very deep and, and kind of weighty for people. So we wanted to make sure that we, we kind of warned people. Um, again, that was not something that we had anticipated, but it, it just, 
it was very real. Happens. And and I mean, to be fair, that happens with a lot of our own writing. Uh, you know, I, yes. I just recently published The Healthy Writer and I have, you know, in there, I have a lot of personal stuff that I went through, you know, at, in my own journey, physical pain and, you know, mental health stuff and uh, addiction things. And, you know, and I think when we write, it's almost our job to go deep because it's, you know, it's our responsibility to go deep because other people can't necessarily do that. So, but just to turn it into into the positive, the character arc of a story is usually the character going from what, however they started to to finishing in a different point. So, if our character has an emotional wound, um, you know, say an abusive childhood that is impacting them now, the kind of the positive half of it is the overcoming their challenges and and uh, triumphing. If that's the type of book you're writing, which is usually right. what I write, which is like a good ending. That's right. Happy. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, a lot of people write literary fiction, which can end negatively, but in genre fiction <laughs> it, it's usually an upbeat ending so would that be how we would tie the emotional wound back to a character arc yes it actually you know you, this the story starts kind of where that that progression ended that i i mentioned earlier from the wound up through the the unmet need then when the story starts the character has a story goal that they are hoping to achieve because they believe it's going to fill that void um and then they they go throughout the course of the story, and and during the course of the story, they encounter experiences that make them aware of what has happened to them or how they are now hurting themselves when they didn't think that that they were doing that. They thought that everything was great, and it makes them aware basically of the things they have to overcome, the things that are keeping them from happiness and fulfillment are the things that they have to look at realistically. They specifically have to come to grips with that lie because that's really at the root of everything, that false belief that they have. Um, and they have to basically refute it and say, okay, that's not the case. That's that's not actually not true. And their behavior as a result comes out of that changed, you know, because again, that that our beliefs dictate our behavior. So once they're able to, to see that lie and overcome it, then their behavior change, starts to change. I mean, it's not obviously immediate. And that's really where the whole backstory piece involving the wound ends up dictating the character arc or leading into the character arc. Um, like you said, in a change arc, that's that's really the way it works. You asked earlier about heroes and villains and how kind of the difference. And I think that very often the hero and the villain are on the same exact journey. They've had something that happened to them that was terrible. Um, all of these you know, offshoots came out of it and are impacting them today. The real difference between the hero and the villain is that the villain is in a, he's in a failed arc. You know, He's in a tragic story. He's either tried to deal with it in the past and was unsuccessful and so is not going to deal with it anymore, or he's just never faced it. Um, or he may make an attempt in the story mm and ends up failing again, or in the rare cases, of course, like, you know, the Darth Vader, where they try again, and they end up to they're, they end up being successful. Um, I think that's, that's really the main difference is that the character arc has either been ignored, or it has already been addressed and and wasn't they weren't successful at it. And that's why that's why they end up being the villain in the story. Mm. It's so fascinating. I do think, you know, when you, if people listening are new writers, this could all, I think this is quite advanced stuff. I mean, I actually, you know, you can have a, you don't have to read all these books in order to write a story. But I think right. once you, you know, once you start getting into trying to understand your own psychology and what you write and what you like to read, then then these are just super interesting. So I really highly recommend the book. So where do people find you and the books and everything you do online? Yes, we have a blog. Um, it's writershelpingwriters.net. And that's where we offer um, just blog writing content in the form of blog posts. We have um, abbreviated forms of our sources there. Uh, all of our books, we have a bookstore on our a bookstore page on our blog that shows you all the different places where you can buy all of our books. And we also have um, another website that is kind of a it's an enhanced version of Writers Helping Writers. It's it's a subscription site that contains all of our thesauruses, but they're all interlinked, and you can get to all of them. There, it's all much more accessible. Um, we also have a lot of tools for writers there. We have a world building tool. We have um, 
story mapping tools, timelines. We're in the process of building a, a comprehensive character building tool, which is very much coming out of what we've learned in writing the Wound Thesaurus book. Um, we basically wanted to make a place where writers had everything they needed. If they want to write a story, you've got the you've got the setting pieces, you've got the character building pieces, you've got the the story mapping piece, and you can kind of come and just it's got everything there, so you're not having to pull from lots of different places. That is one stop for writers.com. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for your time, Becca. That was great. Thank you so much. I was very excited to be here. Thanks for asking me.